Okay, hello everybody. We've got people still petering in. Um, but my name is Michelle Gray, and on behalf of the Atlantic Salmon Conservation Foundation and the Canadian Rivers Institute, um, we would like to welcome you to, to today's webinar. Um, this series is made possible in part thanks to contributions from the Government of Canada. And today we are very pleased to be hosting Bob Newbery. Um, it's hard to give an intro with a biography of Bob Newbery because I would take up the next 30 minutes and then some. So uh, needless to say, he's been prolific in his activities across Canada and the world um, in terms of um, stream hydraulics uh, engineering and stream restoration projects. Um, he and I get to hang out at least a couple times a year um, as he still delivers some uh, courses and workshops with the Canadian Rivers Institute, both on the East Coast and the West Coast. Um, so I think most people have probably heard of him, um, so, and, uh, so I won't say too much more. And like I said, I could go on and on and on. But um, in terms of the webinar, just before we get started, before I hand it over to Bob, for those of you that are new to the series, um, we save questions until the end of the presentation. And to ask a question, you can either use your webinar control panel, the little gray box on the side. And if, the min if it's minimized, you can hit the orange arrow to enlarge it. Um, and there's a little uh, hand that you can raise, a little yellow icon uh, that you can raise your hand. And we can unmute you if you have a mic or you can type your question in the uh, question box in the control panel and we will read it aloud for you during, at the end of the session um, during the questions. Um, just because this is actually our first webinar speaker that's um, also using the webcam, because you can see he's got a nifty chalkboard in behind him. So for those of you um, that are, are new to this, probably pretty much everyone, there should be between his screen um, sorry, the webcam uh, box and his PowerPoint slide, there should be two little white lines. If you drag that, click your mouse and drag that, you can um, make him make the webcam box larger or smaller. So when he turns around and goes to the board, um, you'll be able to increase that. So without further ado, I will now turn the webinar over to Bob, and, um, and then we'll, uh, we'll talk more at the end of the presentation. We're on. We're on, right, Michelle? Okay, well, um, good morning, everyone. If you're west of Saskatchewan, and good afternoon if you're east of Saskatchewan. So Michelle and Darla have talked me into experimenting with the web webinar. So this is the first time I've done this as well. So we'll see how it goes. Basically, I put together what would be a, a kind of a slideshow that I'd use in lecture <clears throat> with a series of um, examples of uh, stream restoration projects to start with before we get into this whole idea of what's the hydraulics behind it. <clears throat> so I have a chance to, to look at a few projects. Um, we'll do that rather quickly just because I want to, to give you the idea of how the hydraulic equations are applied. And then we'll uh, look at the two groups of hydraulic equations that are used in uh, designing streamworks. <clears throat> they're, uh, they're pretty straightforward. They've been around for 100 or 150 years at least. And nothing terribly new has been added to them other than research in hydraulics. So most of the things are in the research field, whereas the applied field, the equations we'll be discussing today, these are equations that would, would have been used for designing most of the works in uh, rivers and streams for the last 150 years. So, and then if we have time at the end, we'll just see how the time goes. Um, we can take a sort of quick virtual trip up to Waskasu Lake, up in Prince Albert National Park, where I just finished a small course for uh, Saskatchewan water <coughs> people on uh, on using these equations. So maybe we'll take an example that will be like a small field trip. Okay, so let's see. When we say restored in the first place, this is a bit of an anomaly because there's so much literature now about stream restoration and what restored means or doesn't mean. But really, it's altering a flow pattern in some way that hopefully makes the local channel work again. In other words, stops erosion or controls sedimentation or something like that. And generally replicates some stream habitat conditions. And I, I say selected because in nearly every project example, there's no chance to go right back to nature. There's already been some alteration either in the 
watershed itself with urbanization or there's been some alteration in the, in the way the uh, stream has been straightened or modified or run over through bridges or has highways built beside it or something. <clears throat> and there's a few things you can do to restore them, but in fact, they'll never go quite back to nature. <clears throat> I'm just pointing this out in the beginning because there's a bit of a tendency to say, well, if I had a natural stream, I should be able to recreate the full suite of conditions that occur in them. And although that may be possible once in a while, in general, this is always a compromise between flood control and other uses that are being made of the water. So I tried to pick three examples in Canada, and this is <clears throat> specifically because Canadian streams don't have a lot of publications about them, and, and uh, generally we tend to use literature from elsewhere in doing stream restoration work. So I tried to pick three from Canada that would sort of point out the adaptations that we have to make to our Canadian landscape. The first one is on the East Coast, and this was done for Parks Canada in Dixon Brook, where restabilization of the stream was really the key interest they had, and then added to that was also at the same time adding some brook trout and juvenile salmon habitat and passage through the stream from the estuary to the headwaters of the stream. On the west coast, it's almost the same kind of a project. Here was a stream in the Let Creek, <coughs> a tributary to Howe Sound, that had active spawning going on, particularly for pinks, chums, and coho salmon. And of course, that stream was straightened and moved through time and lost or extirpated all of the fish species in it because of the manipulations. And then finally, for those freshwater people who aren't totally locked into salmon, sorry, Darla, um, Central Canada, I just picked the North Pine River because it's the typical trout stream restoration project where the stream was realigned and also in the process created adult rainbow trout habitat. So let's take a quick trip through these with just a few slides. First of all, <clears throat> this stream was straightened out in order to accomplish uh, farming, first of all, in the area, and then it was straightened out and aligned to form a golf course, uh, golf course fairways or golf course hazards, I guess I should say. And the stream was moved back and forth in the system in order to make enough challenge in playing on the, on the course. Well, you know, subsequently with that much movement that's going on in the system, um, it actually unstabilized the stream. They went through a whole series of ways of trying to stabilize it again, basically started off with timber lining, then they used riprap, and ultimately the more popular recent things, gabion baskets full of small rocks. Well, you can see what happened. Here's just one example. This is uh, hole number nine as you go back up to the clubhouse, and here's the, uh, here's the stream bed now after about three or 30 years and three different attempts at uh, trying to stabilize it. Obviously, very limited habitat is left in the system. So how would you restore something like this? These streams are unique to the Atlantic coast, and most of this is uh, valleys that had been flooded at one time that have rebounded from the ocean. They have a long geological history. And so the only real guidelines for something like that is to start with a survey of the stream in its natural state. This is seldom possible, of course, in many of these projects, but in the case of national parks, generally speaking, there'll be some part within the park that will allow you to make some, do some, put some surveys together. <clears throat> these points on the graph here, these were done from surveys that's actually put together by Ron Jenkins when he had his own small company down there. And uh, Ron is a surveyor who was pretty interested in stream work, pretty good fisherman as well, and got these data points together for me in order to give me an idea of how the stream behaved above the golf course and above the agricultural areas <clears throat> before it entered it and had been, before it entered those areas and had been altered. Excuse me, I'm going to have a glass of water. <clears throat> the problem of lecturing for 50 years is your voice doesn't kick in until about 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Okay, so these surveys, now they were based on actual streams, <coughs> stream channel cross sections located above the altered zone. And you can see there's a very strong trend in wet, discharge, depth, 
for drainage area. So here we're using a drainage basin, and we're using the area as a as a suit as a substitute for for uh, plotting this, or as as the area code as the area relationship, I should say, for plotting it. I say as a substitute because we could be plotting widths and depths and things versus discharge as well. But in this case, we're predicting the discharge based on the drainage area. So. This is the first use of some of these hydraulic equations. Uh, what was found just briefly was the stream was about half the width that it would have been if it was a natural stream. In other words, it was narrowed in in the golf course, and it had dug itself down about a meter to half a meter to a meter below the floodplain over the years, and it was about 50% steeper than the stream should have been <clears throat> because of straightening and removal of meanders. Well. The outfit of this project was the stream was widened to the natural width that would have been predicted from the upstream cross sections, and it was it was um, rebuilt throughout the golf course in a series of pools and riffles that would absorb some of the extra drop in the stream because of the straightening. Pretty straightforward solution. Um, the stream profile was broken rather specifically up into, into reaches, uh, some of which could break out at points onto the floodplain in order to relieve the stress in the stream when the high floods were on, and those breakout points were selected specifically in areas that would do the least amount of damage. Of course, there are other things added to the stream, as there is in many of these uh, restoration projects. Um, for example, the brook trout required some kind of cover, and smaller fish required cover, so there were root wads and boulders and whatnot that were placed in the pools that were created. If I just go back one, they were placed in the pools that were created behind these riffles that were added to the stream to break up the profile. Well, now let's flash across North America, <laughs> across Canada in a hurry, and uh, take a look at the other coast. So here's another salmon stream. Let Creek was diverted and completely rebuilt back in the 1970s in order to create a log sorting yard for, at that time, it was a Canadian Pacific log sorting yard. Still an active yard, still an active log sort. So back in the 70s, it was uh, seen as a project where it would actually try to rebuild uh, a natural relate a natural looking channel okay like so and it actually had a floodplain built with it which is fairly rare usually these things get altered without paying much attention to whether there's a floodplain or not so what happened here first of all it was straightened so again we had an increased gradient in the stream but at that time, um, there was quite a bit of literature back in the 70s about stream restoration, putting in rock walls that would break up the stream to create uh, um, plunged pools, or sometimes they put in what were called digger logs. These were logs placed across the stream, and the idea was the water would flow over those and create some kind of a pool downstream. Rather than designing it from a hydraulic point of view to make the pools in the first place, the idea was that the water would do the work. Well. Two years later, two floods later, it certainly did the work. The whole stream dropped about a meter and a half because it was so steep. No longer was it a gravel bed stream because now for this kind of slope, in fact, it was a cobble bed stream or almost a boulder bed stream if you see here. These, these logs are up to four feet in diameter. All you can see is the bigger logs. The sills that were concrete, they were completely buried. The water simply poured over the sill and made a hole downstream and then the the, uh, the uh, rock sills just dropped in. <clears throat> now, the solution here was to go back to the stream almost to the same locations where those works were done. Now, this is uh, almost uh, 15 years later. Go back to the stream and rebuild these pools and riffles in it, letting the, letting the geometry of the stream create the pools and accumulate gravel rather than hoping that digger logs or, or rock sills of some kind would uh, would do it for you. So this is what it ended up looking like. First of all, I should go back just one here. First of all, there were riffles built upstream in the stream that broke up the gradient, again to make up for the fact that it had been straightened and shortened break up the gradient enough so that gravels could accumulate up here. And as far as pools go, these are narrow riffles where the water shoots through here and actually excavates a pool downstream. 
As you go further down, <coughs> there are also riffles for pink and chums that don't require pools below them, and these are broad crested riffles where the water comes off the riffle and simply spreads out over a, and accumulates a wide, a wide uh, bed of gravel upstream. I'll just go back one because I hit that accidentally. In other words, the pool is being formed by the water, but the water is entering at a shallow angle into the stream downstream, so down here the pool is created, rather than when we had a rock sill across here and the pool was created right here and the rock sill fell into it. You notice in all of these there's a very shallow angle of re-entry. In other words, these riffle surfaces have to be built so that the water is coming back into the stream channel at a fairly shallow angle, sometimes it's as low as 5% grade coming back in. This avoids the problem of undercutting of these structures. <clears throat> of course, once this is done, you start to accumulate gravel above the crest of these riffles, and very soon you end up with spawning fish that pick up on this very, very quickly. I didn't have a good, clear picture from, from the coast, so if you'll forgive me, this is a project on the, on the Okanagan River, and this riffle was just built three weeks ago. This is the gravel that's accumulated, and these are the sockeye that show up as soon as that crest, rapid flow, and fine spawning gravels accumulate in the river. Okay, so. So much for these ones that have these uh, <coughs> channels that have been straightened or altered and somehow we're absorbing energy and trying to figure out what works we could put in that would restore a few of these simpler things. Here's a case now where there's realignment of the stream that's required. This is on the Pine River after a storm. You can see this made the Globe and Mail, in fact, which is a rare thing for a Western Canadian stream. It's a little Westerner bias there. And in fact, this thing was tearing down through uh, one of the provincial highways, and every time it would come to one of these highway bridges, it was wiping them out. So what was the problem exactly? Well, it was that when the highway was put in, the stream was straightened out, actually, to run along this line. I tried to put a small arrow on top of this, and they were running through the highway bridges at a skewed angle. This means that at low flow, of course, the water can make come down the stream and turn through the bridge piers, but at high flow, it hammers into the bridge piers, and it greatly decreases the, the available width, if you want, for the flow. It, it sort of makes sense when that floods on, and let's say it's going three or four meters per second, it really, it's going through and under the bridge in a matter of just a few seconds. So that isn't enough time for the momentum of the flow to turn and suddenly run parallel to the bridge at high flows. So the idea was, could you restore some of these streams so that they actually lined up with the bridges rather than replacing them all? Well, in other words, could you put curves in the river that would allow them to enter the bridges at right angles and have a higher discharge capacity than when the floods were on? Well, that, again, comes back to what exactly do you do for a curve in the river? And that was started off by, that started off with a, a bit of a study of what meander loops looked like on these streams. Oh, here and all the way along the Manitoba escarpment and even as far as uh, over into Alberta, surveys were made of, uh, of uh, meanders in which there was known trout habitat. Most of them looked pretty much like this, on, as this one is on the Pine River. There was a riffle here and then a long meander curve down through here. The streams were not moving particularly quickly in the meanders. In fact, you can see the way these old uh, birch trees are bending upwards here. It meant that as the meander moved downstream, as the roots eroded here, in fact, the tree had time to create it, to correct its growth habit and grow straight all the time. It's falling in now, of course. So these are not straight floodplain trees. These are trees that are affected by movement of the river into their roots and then the trees themselves correcting their growth habits. So you could say in a way the meander is moving about as fast as, uh, as a tree can grow. So one of the unique characteristics about this was then for this width of stream, we had a crest up here on the riffle that was controlling the pool up here. The water came very shallowly, as you can see, a shallow angle of re-entry, and it comes down into here. You can see from the bubbles on the surface, the water is cast against the outside bend, and it, whoops, sorry, and it actually turns and comes back up onto the point bar here. 
So there's this helical flow that occurs when the radius of curvature is just about set at two or three times the width of the string. Now we discovered this ourselves by doing the surveys, and it turns out that's about the median uh, ratio between meander curvatures and widths of stream. I guess in a way, if you could think about it, um, if that's the median value, the, in other words, the most likely condition to occur in a meander bend, then it's not surprising that it's the most likely place that you might find adult fish. I mean, they're not stupid. They don't go into bad curves or rare curves. They go into places where there's a nice helical flow, and the insects are being delivered from up here into the, into the pool down here. So the construction here was a matter of taking the straight stream that used to run through here at a skewed angle and simply bending it back around in these meander curves so that it passes under the highway at right angles. That was built in 1990. Um, a couple of years later, it was enormously improved by floods. In other words, you could only build so much. And here now is a, a without much vegetation around, but you can see after a couple of floods, this is the upstream here, or Yes, this is the upstream end that comes around through here, and it's actually building its own point bar in here without us doing it with a machine. And then I was curious about whether it was still there because, of course, meanders migrate. So here we are in 2010, almost 20 years later, and I took a Google image. There's uh, snow and ice on the stream, so it shows up very nicely. And you can see the pools are here and the highway bridge, and actually not very much has happened. I think there might be a little bit of movement down in here somewhere, but but uh, by and large, of course, it's all still there. There are a few publications around. We'll come back to this at the end of, uh, of this talk. There are a few publications around for predicting the movement in riffles and, uh, riffles and pools and meanders, uh, mostly based on the idea of studying meanders. And it was a not bad one in about 2005 by the US Department of uh, Transport that uh, you can actually download online. I'll put that in the references later. OK, so here were these projects, a quick sample across Canada. Uh, well, one of the main things about them was they all required some kind of pre-project surveys in natural reaches or at least of select habitats that could be built into the system. And they were all addressing some man-made problem, straightening golf courses, bridges, highways, whatever. So they had to accomplish two things. They had to reestablish the stream processes in some stable way, and then with a bit of surveys and some transferred information from other places, they could have habitats built along with the project. OK, so where do we go with this? How do we design these things? Well, it turns out that the hydraulic equations, I put them on the board here behind me, the hydraulic equations, there's only seven or eight of them, and they're, they're, they pretty well describe everything we can do in terms of a kind of schematic design for something. They don't take into account turbulence. They don't take into account this helical flow or this wonderful rapid surveys, rap, wonderful flow in rapids, I should say, where you have aeration and the water breaking up into a whole different bunch of forms. In fact, they're best, they're kind of a schematic way of designing things. So what are the simplest ones? First of all, there's uniform flow equations, Those are the kind of equations that would apply to the St. Mary Canal, for example. Here's a nice uniform channel, perfectly well built. And we could describe the discharge unit as the average width times the average depth times the average velocity. Now, average velocity means that all of the water in a cross section moves with the same moves with the same velocity. Right off the bat, we know that's not true. I mean, we know that it moves more slowly on the edges. We know that it moves more quickly in here. We know it moves more quickly towards the top of the flow than it does at the bottom of the flow. However, for the sake of our schematic dis analysis, again, to use this word schematic, we say that everything moves at the same velocity. So that's the first one. The discharge is equal to the velocity, essentially, times the cross-sectional area. So what determines the velocity? Well, the velocity is all gradient driven. So it's all really dependent on the slope of this canal. <clears throat> and it's dependent on how large the flow is, how large the cross-section is. And obviously, if, uh, if it's very shallow flow, it's held back by the bottom because most of it's inter being interfered with by friction on the bed of the stream. But if we have very deep flow, there would be up parts of the, 
top of the flow or the upper parts of the flow where the friction is quite far away and the water can obviously go faster. Now the way we adjust for that is we put in a kind of a depth factor here, a slope factor here, and then because this is such a simple equation, we have one correlation coefficient to allow for all of these other vagaries that we've, that we've generalized or done schematically, and that's Manning's N value in North America, or Shazy's C value if you happen to be in Europe. The hydraulic radius is uh, more used in designing uh, narrow channels where there's some effect of drag on the sides of the channel, but for most natural channels this works out to pretty well the depth of the channel because most natural channels are, well, let's see, they're about 15 or 20 times wider than they are deep, so a little bit of drag on the side is terribly offset by all the drag on the bottom, but you could see if you had a man-made channel like this or like this in the case of the St. Mary's Canal, well, you could see that the sides would play a factor in it. So the radius is, uh, hydraulic radius is this kind of theoretical number that we introduce to allow for some side drag. The problem, of course, is this coefficient of friction has to allow for everything that's not uniform. So Manning's N is a highly variable thing and subject to quite a bit of interpretation. It's almost something that has to be surveyed in itself if you're dealing with rugged streams and particularly at low flow. The other equation that comes out of this, almost based on the same idea, is the shear stress is going to be equal to the weight of water. That would be 1,000 kilograms per cubic meter times its depth, that would be the weight pushing down, and times the slope of the stream, meaning the small component of gravity that would be parallel to the stream bottom. And we call that the shear stress, or sometimes in engineering we'd call that the tractive force. So I've used T in here just because that's where it shows up mostly in engineering literature. So the problem is we have a bit of work to do to figure out the hydraulics unless we build a canal. If we build uniform canals or concrete canals or drainage ditches, the hydraulics is pretty straightforward. But once we start into manipulating the flow to create some of these habitats and to make the stream a more natural uh, sequence of hydraulic conditions, well, then it becomes a little more difficult. In this lovely uniform flow condition, <clears throat> we can see that the energy of the stream is being expended as it goes down the stream. It starts off at a higher point here, so the total energy, that's the height above some datum, is being lost as it goes down the stream through here. If it's uniform, the depth and the kinetic energy of the flow, those two things are called the specific energy. They're the energy at one point in the stream. The depth and the kinetic energy of this flow would be uniform as you go down from one cross-section to another cross-section. So this is allows us to predict the flow and the velocities in a reach. It's true that it can vary a bit if there's a, a something downstream like a dam or maybe a waterfalls where there'll be a slow change or a backwater curve in the channel. But we can use this equation for this idea of it being uniform if we break the channel up in a lot of small segments and treat each segment as though each one is a straight line rather than a curve. Again, it's still all driven by the friction on the bed of the stream that's holding the water back or establishing what we believe to be the average velocity. You can do this by hand, and, and I used to make all the students when I was teaching hydraulics at Manitoba years ago, I'd make them certainly do this by hand, first of all, to understand this idea that even this long curve in the water surface that we were modeling could be broken up into small pieces. Really, how many small pieces you took meant made quite a difference in what your solution was. In other words, if you took too big a piece, you ended up with a stream that looked like it was uh, some kind of robot turning at right angles all the time, some sharp angles. Um, of course, nowadays, this is easily programmed, and there are freeware programs, and in particular, the one that's used the most is the heck RAS program that allows you to break up a reach of stream into small pieces to do this kind of uniform flow analysis. HECRAS is the Hydraulic Engineering Center River Analysis System of the U.S. Corps of Engineers. As far as establishing the roughness goes, just to come back to that, because this is a particular problem in Canada, in general, you have to start off with surveys in the stream you're working in. 
This is because we have so few alluvially based streams in Canada. Many of them are in channels that once had much larger flows in them. They're old post-glacial meltwater channels or they're glacial deposits of some kind that the channels have been, that the present day rivers have encountered. And so you have very large lag deposits or you have breaks in slope that uh, the stream is just unable to overcome and so you don't have very nice smooth profiles, for example, as you might find in, in southern uh, gravel bed streams in the United States. United States literature, of course, is, certainly dominates the Canadian literature, so much of that transferability of these kind of idealized gravel bed streams or idealized streams that have formed their own valley um, has to be taken with some caution because a lot of the valleys that we run in in Canada are where they were there before these present day streams, often produced by ice melt or by some kind of form of glaciation. This isn't such a hard thing to do. Remember, this equation is so simple anyway, the schematic equation. If we just switch the, the V on the right-hand side here and put it on the denominator and take N from over here and put it on the numerator here, and we measure the width and the depth and the slope, we can solve then for R, and we, and we can substitute the slope in here, and of course we can solve for the N value. So these things can be surveyed. Velocity can be measured, and therefore you can establish the end value for this river at this particular flow. I measure that particular. I just mentioned that particularly because, as an engineer, you're really picking flows that are flood flows. When this channel doesn't look like this, this channel would be somewhere with flows that are up about the waist high of the rodman over there, and probably over the head of this guy down here right here, so we'd have flood flows up here, and as you can see, the effect of the bed would be smaller than it is right now. In other words, when you have a high depth of flow, the Manning's end values tend to decrease, and those are the ones that are in the literature, because after all, we're more worried about being flooded, about causing flooding, or being sued by somebody because of our project, rather than we are about anything uh, at low flow. But don't forget, um, at low flow, that's, uh, that's the condition in streams about 80, 85 percent of the time. So if we're trying to create habitats, we have to know something about the hydraulics at low flow when these end values are much higher. And I just used one example of uh, Chapman Creek on the west coast. Here's a, here's a range of end values you get with discharge. If you go up to something like 50 or 60 cubic meters per second, then you have an end value of 0.05. But if you drop back to one or two or three or four uh, cubic meters per second, you could have it as low as 0.15. So you think about that when you're allocating water from an upstream reservoir or trying to analyze the system. Uh, if you use this flood value for low flow conditions, you could be out two or three times in your estimate of what sort of flows you would require, say, for depth in the stream or for flow maintenance between bars. Okay. Second group of equations have to deal then with these other features that are more complex than that uniform flow. The uniform flow, remember, assumes that we have this nice uniform channel that changes very, very slowly between cross sections, and the flow is governed by the friction of the bed. And, and by the velocities governed by the friction and the depth of flow. Second group of equations, they also use the depth of flow and velocity, but they're more related to things that happen locally where friction is not a factor. In fact, they're really flow conditions that are formed by the geometry or the local geometry of the stream such as this rock where the water is flowing over a fairly sharp rock here. It's going along slowly as it approaches the rock. It goes more quickly, more quickly until it comes over the top, flows over at a very interesting case of, in velocities here that's called the critical velocity. It's the, it's the velocity at which things spill over some object. And then as it accelerates down the face of the rock, it goes faster and faster until it finally hits the deep water down here where it decelerates. Well, water has a high tensile strength, so as long as I'm pulling water with faster flow here and slower flow here, I can pull it out almost like a sheet of saran wrap. High light penetration, clear water, this is not laminar flow or anything like that, it's still turbulent flow, but it's just being stretched out, if you want, as it accelerates over an object. But of course the water has no shear strength. So as soon as the fast water enters the slow water, it penetrates the slow water, 
air that's on the surface of this water here is carried into the slow water, and that air has to come back up to the surface, and so we have this huge frothing area of white water as it decelerates into here. So remember I said this is a specific case where water flows over the top of an object, and that's easily predicted. That's called the critical depth and the critical velocity as it flows, as it flows over the top. If it's less than that velocity, back here, it's subcritical. If it's more than that velocity as it falls down this little chute, it's supercritical. Then it goes through this transition from fast flow to slow flow, so that's accomplished in a hydraulic jump. It just means that the water level actually rises below here and here, so this is one of the few places where you could say water flows upstream in a way. And then, of course, it goes back to subcritical flow over here. Well, what are the equations here? The same one. The specific energy at any point is here is the depth plus v squared over 2g. The critical depth can be calculated knowing the width of the stream and the discharge, and the critical depth is the one that occurs right on the crest here. And the critical velocity is related to that in a simple equation here. It's the square root of gravity times the critical depth. So the thing about this is the water is flowing over here on top of here with the least amount of energy required to pass that flow. Well, that's a strange condition in nature. As you spill over something, it takes the least amount of specific energy. So let's see what the implication of that is. Here's the water now coming over the crest of something like these riffles that we saw added to the stream. As it passes over the stream, it has the least amount of depth going over it. In other words, it comes down to this critical depth here. It's accelerating the water from upstream, where it's being governed by the frictional velocity, where it has subcritical flow. It zooms down the face of this crest, and off the face of this crest, into subcritical flow over here. So we go from uniform flow into locally varied flow. And this is the key, then, in changing these streams. We have normal flow in them. That's the the one that's governed by friction. We can introduce objects into the stream that will accelerate them slowly. They may make a run for a bit and go back to some kind of normal flow or, or uniform flow, but then again we can introduce something that will slow them down and speed them up again. All of this can be done with a certain range with the same specific energy. In other words, there's a kind of limitation to this, of course. You have to know how much there is here. But all of these changes here can be made as long as I don't change the specific energy and I don't change the upstream uh, flood levels. Well, in some cases, of course, you may want to change those to get through a culvert or whatever. So that would be you'd set your own specific energy. Well, the solution then for these three projects. First of all, here's Dixon Brook. Here's the riffles as they are shown schematically, and now I'm using this HEC-RAS program to draw the profile. So here's these two riffles that we looked at, riffles and pools, a second ago, and here's what they look like on the program. They come down like this, this water spills over them, spills over them, spills over You notice there's only a few cross sections, so it really says the water flows like this, and then it's sharp to here and sharp to here. Now if I put more cross sections in here, I could get a bit of a curve in here that would be more realistic. Here's the second one. Here's what Ouellet Creek looks like. Upstream from here, you have this much specific energy. And as you go over this river, you had a total amount of specific energy of 1.86 meters. That's what you'd have approaching here. So that's made up of the depth plus v squared over 2g. And then that's been broken up into three components. One of them is the height of the riffle. 0.78 meters, and then the, the minimum specific energy it takes to get it over this crest. So this limits how high the riffle can be. Third section, third project I should say we, can, we looked at, here's this meandering one for rebuilding the bridge, and this is just a hand-drawn one. Here we're not going to back flood from one riffle to another because you have to leave enough energy and there has to be enough slope in the stream to make this helical flow occur. So here the riffles only flood part way back. If you want partly back up, if there was no flow here, they would flood only. Oops, sorry, would only flood part way back up the the uh, meander bend because that leaves half of the energy or so to be expended in the meander bend, which causes this wonderful rotational flow and delivers the food to the to the fish in the pools. So just to recap. <clears throat> 
we have two sets of equations, just three or four equations in each one. We have ones that describe normal flow, then we have these local flow conditions, and what we're doing is switching it for the same amount of energy. We're switching it back and forth between those two flow patterns in order to create stability in the system, eat up some of the gradient in some cases, and to create these local habitat conditions. You notice none of this has anything to do with uh, sort of uh, templated or, or cookie cutter solutions where you drop in something and something else. All of this has to do simply with manipulating the hydraulics of the system. We could take a quick trip in the last minute here to take a look at a riffle that's designed on the Waskasu outlet, uh, Waskasu Lake outlet and the Waskasu River. Here, this was just a couple of weeks ago, and this is Saskatchewan water folks that were up there, and uh, so we had a couple of days doing what we uh, just described in the last uh, 30 minutes. We did that over a day and a half. You can see I have to go a little quickly here. <clears throat> and so the, uh, after we talked about those equations, then we went to see how they might be applied to this riffle. Well, Prince Albert National Park, so three or four hours north of Saskatchewan. <clears throat> Some years ago, Parks Canada wanted to get rid of a, a small dam that was here that was blocking fish passage, and the idea was, we talked about them replacing it with a fish passable riffle. Um, if we looked at a Google image, you could see here's the highway and here's the, uh, this is actually a walking bridge now for looking at the riffle, but basically a pool was created about 30 meters wide with the riffle crests in here and going into the river that's about 20 meters wide downstream. Um, the depths of flow that had to go through the riffle for the lake levels, well, the lake uh, in the summer with floods going on might go up about 0.3 meters and the maximum flow that maximum stage it had to go up to was about 0.9 meters. And if we looked at the crest of the riffle here, this would be the upstream crest on this riffle system, and there it is again, still going on and on about critical flow. Critical flow occurs right across the edge of this thing as the water comes out of the lake from over here and spills into the river down here. So this means we can calculate <coughs> how much discharge there would be for these different lake levels going over here because we know with critical flow we can predict the discharge. So what does it look like? Well, here's basically the top of this riffle. Here's the height between the lake uh, level up here and the elevation of the crest of the riffle. <clears throat> we can calculate what that specific energy is and therefore we can calculate what the velocity is and therefore we can say that at the high levels the riffle has to pass 43 cubic meters per second and at the lower levels of 0.3 meters it has to pass 8 cubic meters per second. Of course that was the the maximum flood you could anticipate, and this is about the average uh, spring flood or summer flood that would occur in here. <clears throat> so how would you design that? Well, first of all, you could do it just from first principles. Um, you know how high the riffle is, you know what sort of slope you'd like to have on it, uh, in this case a 20 to 1 slope, and it turns out you'd have a riffle that would be about 30 meters long, in other words, with a the five percent slope on here and a meter and a half high it would be about and for the slope of the riverbed it would be something in the order of about 30 meters <coughs> you could ask a program like the Australian shoot program to design this for you you simply have to put in how much it drops in the shoot a little over 1.5 meters and how long you want the shoot to be and in a very simple process, it would do all these calculations for you after you hit the run button, and it would draw you the profile of the riffle, it would show you the depth, it would show you the specific energy on the way down, it would even predict the velocity, and in fact, it would predict what rock sizes would be stable with different discharges. So here's a program that does all of those equations that we've talked about in about two milliseconds. Guru in this. Um, you could also use something like fish crossing, where you could you could fake the culvert. In other words, you could say that instead of uh, calling it an upstream culvert, I'll let fish crossing do the calculations for me, as though this was a 30 meter wide box culvert with uh, nothing on top that was going to obstruct the obstruct the flow. <clears throat> 
Oh, fish crossing is another program that's quite handy to put this in. You'd have to say that it, the culvert had a rocky bottom, and it was, uh, in this case, 3,000 centimeters wide. That's a pretty big culvert. <clears throat> but the advantage of letting fish crossing do the calculations, the hydraulics, is that you can also select fish and test them to see how they would go through the system. So here we run this program once again very quickly. It tells you there's a fish barrier in the system. And it looks something like this. It says if we run this at uh, 8 cubic meters per second, fish can swim through this riffle. If we run it at half a cubic meter per second, in other words, summer low flows, there's actually insufficient depth for the fish to get through. I think I'm testing walleye in this case. And if I run it <clears throat> up to about 2.3, it takes at least that much water going up this pseudo-culvert in order to pass through it. And if I test it for, say, white suckers, which are also in this system, I'd end up saying that I, uh, I would have a, also a velocity barrier. And it looks like for this kind of a long system, you're really going to have a block in here of either depth or velocity for the fish species we're looking at that uh, occurs about 10 or 12 meters along the culvert. So that's where the idea for the design came from. Instead of having just one long 30-meter riffle in here, if, what if you broke it up into three 10-meter riffles, survived, survived, uh, separated, I should say, by, say, five-meter pools? Well, that's something that you can calculate again, longhand. But again, if you put these cross-sections into this HECRAS model, it'll do all the calculations for you. And here is the profile. Here's a 10-meter riffle, here's a 5-meter pool, here's another 10-meter riffle, 5-meter pool. In other words, again, these are schematics, and this is the way the river, the, the HECRAS program thinks the river behaves, but we know it's way more complex than that. But it's good enough for you to make the calculations without having to go through all of the detailed hand calculations that we discussed when we first started off. So in conclusion, I was trying to do this in 40 minutes, and it looks like I'm about five minutes over. But uh, just in conclusion, all of these things work fairly well. If you work in Canada, as we do, it means that the literature is going to be pretty limited about these sort of double history channels and valleys. You know, so one, a valley established by glaciation or by glacial runoff. And then <clears throat> down here, we have river data in the literature that's established in alluvial streams. So this means you pretty well have to gather your own data if you're working in Canada. References, I put a list on at the end here, but basically they consist of a simple one, if you've never done hydraulics before, something like Practical Hydraulics, a very good book by Melvin Kay. If you really get into it, the old historical textbook for open channel flow was done by Venta Chow back in 1959, and just about every modern book is related back to that. <clears throat> in terms of the fluvial processes, the database from the U.S. is very much uh, part of this early work that was done by Leopold, Wolman, and Miller back in the 50s and 60s. It's been replicated in a number of ways. Uh, the book, Fluvial Processes, or their book that they put out in 1964, has been reproduced by Dover, so here's a paperback version. And if you want a contemporary version, probably Matt Condolf at, uh, at uh, California, University of California, Berkeley, is probably the leading person in terms of actually research in geomorphology and fluvial geomorphology right now. Expensive books, these new ones, but that's the way it goes. Canada, what do we do in Canada? What a problem. So here's all these special conditions I'm talking about. Where would you go? Well, one that I use quite a bit when looking at uh, rivers in Canada is this Hydrology of Floods in Canada, an NRC publication um, put out now almost 15 or 20 years ago. And then I've been trying to compile these Canadian projects just in the ones that I've done schematic designs for or, or ones that have been built where we have some some verification that they're still there and still working in a project casebook that the Rivers Institute uh, distributes. There's a list on the end of this. I'm pretty sure Darla or um, Michelle can put this out and send this out to you. The books that I've just listed are here. And then this is the three programs I quickly looked at on the Waskasu Riffle, HECRAS to do the hydraulic calculations, shoot to do the riffle calculations, fish crossing to test them against fish passage. So there we go.
now I'm ready for any questions, and I also don't know how that works. <laughs> Thank you, Bob. This is Michelle again. So anybody, if they want to raise their hands, I can unmute you. And um, if not, you can type your questions um, into the chat box, and I can ask the question for you. So we'll give people a couple seconds to either raise their hand or do some typing. I scared them all. Yeah, you messed up. <laughs> They're thinking deeply. No, that's okay. A couple more slides we didn't get to. So. <laughs> How can you tell when you've lectured this many years that you stop at 50 minutes because the bell's <laughs> going to go and all the engineering students just get up and walk out? They don't worry about whether you're still talking or not. <laughs> Nice. Okay, we do have a question. We've got Carolee McCaskill. Um, she says, can you send me this PowerPoint because I missed it. thought it was at 3 p.m. Carolee, you're not the only one that gets the time zones mixed up. So we will have a recording um, that will be posted on the Atlantic Salmon Conservation Foundation website probably within a day or two. Um, and Joshua McNeely has the smiley face and says, yes, you did scare us all. <laughs> <laughs> I'll give people a few seconds. I'll just have, uh, I'll put in a shameless plug. Um, the Canadian Rivers Institute will be lucky to have Bob um, give, um, deliver a couple of his uh, courses next year. He, co he teams up with uh, Rick Kunjak from UNB and delivers a river habitats and hydraulics course, which we will hold. We don't have the date set yet, but that will be in later August. Um, and then we are going to follow that. This year it's a different situation. We're going to follow that by, that's a seven-day field course aimed at grad students, but professionals um, take it quite a bit. And then at the end we'll have a two-day stream restoration. So this will be more on the design stuff that he was talking about here today. It will be a two-day workshop also held in Miramichi. Okay, so now that I blabbed for a little bit, we did get a question. Um, Rebecca Herson-Peterson says, can you explain the difference between pushing and turning water briefly? Mm. Well, <clears throat> first of all, you can't push water at all, right? <clears throat> because it has no shear strength, so it just turns into a bundle of nothing. But what happens is you can turn water by drawing it. So the whole idea is that you create gradients that pull the water towards you. Remember that the water is, has a stronger tensile strength than steel does. So if you want to turn the water just one side or the other, then you have to find a way of drawing the water towards some downstream point that's lower. <clears throat> but pushing the water, you really can't shove the water away from anything. You can create a narrower channel, say, by putting some bars in a meander bend or something like that. But really, it's still drawing the water around the bend, and it's how it operates has very much to do with what the low point is that draws it towards that around the bend. But you can't take the bend and sort of shove the water off, the, off of it. I mean, that really doesn't work. Yeah, you often see cases where people think they're pushing the water around, but actually it's just creating a flow pattern that's going towards some lower point where the water is being drawn towards it. If it really did push the water, let's say we had bars or something that were so large that they actually blocked the water, then of course it just breaks up in that great foaming white water and goes off somewhere else and around to the side of it or makes a diversion around it. Okay. I don't know if that was enough of an answer, but it's, when you think about it, it kind of makes sense. It's sort of like it's sort of like if you're taking saran wrap out of the box and you said, well, I would like to put the saran wrap over my sandwich here. I, c I can pull it over there as long as I'm going pulling and keeping the tension on it. I can wrap up my sandwich. But if I then take the saran wrap and say, oh, I think I'll just push it over my sandwich, forget it. You're going to end up with a handful of saran wrap. And that's almost the way water behaves. I think that, so, oh, no, wait a minute, I got another one. Oh, I was going to say, um, I have. Uh, you go ahead. Michelle, I was going to say, I, I put on the last couple of slides, because the, I'll tell you what the most frequently asked questions are, <laughs> which is, first of all, how do you build these things in the stream? <laughs> 
Right. So nearly everyone says, but Bob, this is really interesting, but how the heck do you ever do this? <clears throat> well, there is a bit of a trick to it. Here's one back flooding uh, McIntyre Dam in order to make a jumping pool for sockeye salmon so they can jump over the, over the, over the gates. This is a case where you have to have lots of depth because the way fish jump, they, they accelerate to the bottom of the pool and really they launch themselves like a, like a missile. When, we call it a jump, but really it's just, a, it's just their high velocity coming out of the pool. So the pool has to be deep enough. So here's a two meter high riffle being built by putting rocks in the stream and building it up in layers so that it's watertight. And they're using the machine to actually pack the material in here. Um, here's another case where these are riffles being built to back flood some drop structures. So here's a case where the machine can't actually get in the water. We'd like to keep the tracks out of the water. So there's one machine on the bank that's handing rocks off here, and there's a truck delivering the rocks up here. He hands them off. There. These guys have a couple of radios, and he's asking for different sizes of rocks. So as he goes across here as he builds the riffle, he's actually building his own ramp in here. So these things require often building in the wet like this. The other thing that I usually get a question on is, is what, how do you ever predict the meanders and the meander migration? And this is again coming back to this reference that I put in here earlier, where they actually did a study of all the different options there are for meander forms and what happens to them. And this is covered pretty well in that Condolph book, or you can also download it as a PDF from here. The reason I put it in is it's just that the conclusion here, at here, this is a study done over the years in the U.S., was that the, the river zone is the best model of what the river is. In other words, you have to study the river to get the answer. This always seems to be a difficulty in, in uh, uh, dealing with restoration projects where they're in a specific area, and the contract is to examine the problem there, but the answer to the solution is I have to study more of the river that's outside of the project area. And there's often not funding for that. So this is the, the other problem that I am frequently asked about. The other one is, is there anything that is a good way of uh, getting community groups involved in this so that you have some idea of where, what kinds of problems you have? And probably the best one I've seen is uh, the River Care Project in, the, uh, in Australia where they've actually taken the specific stream they were concerned with <clears throat> they put together the worst conditions in vegetation or riparian zones and rivers, and those are both called red reds. And then you can go out to your own piece of river channel and compare whether it's a red red or whether it's perfectly good and green green. In other words, the examples are gathered locally from that particular river and used to assess the conditions. So those are the questions I often get <laughs> afterwards. What do we do about this? Okay. Only someone who's been teaching as long as you actually has question or answer slides already ready in your slide deck. Um, okay. So, so, so it happens when you start in 1964 <laughs> at the University of Manitoba. Once in a while, I hear from students about how happily retired they are. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Uh, we do have a few questions lined up now. Um, Chun Ping U says, "Thank you for your wonderful lecture in practical engineering design." Which method should we choose in your mentioned four methods? Which, sorry, which was it again? Which, which method should we choose of your four mentioned, of, oh, of the four mentioned methods? Oh, right, right. Well, actually, all of them are the same. They all will produce the same answer. Um, they just, they're just easier ways of doing the same calculations. These few, you know, I actually wrote them on the board behind me. You count them up, there's only, what, four? three, seven, and maybe a couple more up there. There's only seven or eight equations. <clears throat> all of those programs use just exactly those seven or eight equations. So you could do all of the same solution longhand. Personally, I run all of them. I, I uh, did, uh, used to teach a course in the winters in Australia. Of course, that's understandable. And, uh, and I came across the shoot program, which I thought was really ingenious. But, you know, it, uh, it just uh, it's another one that you could add to your toolkit. So if I was looking at it, I would say, basically, you certainly should have a HECRAS program running. Simple to download. It's a freebie that you can download on your, uh, on your um, computer. 
It runs under Windows, of course, unfortunately, but you can unload that, you can download that as a freeware. So I would start by having that one. That one covers off, if you look behind me, that covers off uniform flow and it covers off even the rapidly varied flow conditions. It's just that if you want the rapidly varied, the local flow conditions, in some cases, like a riffle or a rapids, you might have to put a cross section in every meter or two in order to make the flow profile accurate. So I'd certainly start with that. I like the shoot program uh, to check out on... <laughs> that wasn't me. I like the shoot program to check out on the rock sizes and things. It's really the same calculation down through a riffle. And then I like the fish crossing program, again, the same, uh, same hydraulic equations, but I like it because I can couple it with some fish swimming speeds. In other words, I don't have to look them up and test them against what I see in the heck grass. I can have it run the velocities, and then I can test different fish species against it. So all of them I would use in, in designs. Okay. Uh, next up, we've got Carolee McCaskill. She says, I don't know if this is entirely relevant, but what do you suggest for techniques to mitigate stream bank erosion in sandy soils with not very turbulent flows? Right. So again... We're back to the uh, we're back to this question of gradient. So you could you could imagine, say on that golf course example. So here was one where these greens and the golf course and the tee boxes and all these are very expensive things to maintain. So they don't want any erosion at all. So here's a case where we want no bank erosion. So how would you overcome that? Well, you do that in a step channel where every riffle slowly kind of comes off the riffle and decelerates into slow flow through a pool and then it drops over the next riffle. In other words, there's no gradient between them to transport the material. So that's the, that's the most extreme case where you, you build a step channel that would be also the same as you might do, say, for fish passage around a dam if you're trying to build a small channel, a natural channel, looking channel around the dam. You might have one that is just in little stages and all the energy is eaten up in these drops as it goes down. On the other hand, uh, there's a point at which the sand starts to move that you would like to not reach if you want to stabilize. In other words, there's a velocity you'd like to contain. So you could see stretching those riffles out, those gradient controls out, so you still had velocity between them, which would still maintain the channel and some fish habitat and things in it as well. And therefore, it would be driven by how much gradient would it take not to transport the sand and to cause this bank erosion. In other words, how do I slow it down enough? Well, generally, there's a few equations that describe that. Um, you could take this one up here. Uh, it, this is, says that uh, if you relate the shear stress in the bed to the size of material, you could figure out what slope and depth you could have for the size of material before it starts to move. And that would tell you what how much gradient you had to eat up in these other uh, harder controlled riffle sections. So it's really looking at the stream, surveying the gradient, looking at the materials, and seeing what gradient would it tolerate to stop the bank erosion <laughs> in the system. Bank erosion isn't so much velocity at the bank. I mean, there is high velocity in the meanders and things, but it's not so much at the bank. What happens with bank erosion is the bed of the stream is eroding because that's where the high shear stress is, and then, of course, the banks keep slumping in and are carried away. So if you can stop the transport of material on the bed, then generally the banks can be stabilized in the system. Okay. Okay. Next we have a question from Trevor Floyd from DFO. He says, often community groups doing this work have limited budgets for doing restoration work. Can you give us a range of costs associated with some of these projects? Um, he's got a couple more. Maybe I'll let you finish that and then I'll carry on after. Sure. The, um, the costs, of course, depend very much on who does the work and, uh, and how, much, uh, how many studies have been done or public hearings or whatever else, as we all know. It's a pretty big deal. But when we first started doing this, uh, Mark Gabry and I were in Manitoba at the time, and most of the projects on uh, walleye and trout and things were done in the central Canada. And we, would, we were building these riffles using field stone and local contractors. And, and our estimate for the stream um, would be, for a riffle, say, to break up the gradient, would be less than $3,000. Now, time goes away, and suddenly this is, uh, now this is 
part of a stream restoration technique that goes on and that gets goes out to consulting and studies and hearings and reviews and all the rest of it. So lately, um, we've been seeing costs that are up in the order of maybe twenty thousand uh, dollars, but maybe six or seven times the cost, like the riffles that I just showed being built on the Okanagan River. That one that was in there, that that turned out to be probably worth about thirty thousand um, dollars. But it doesn't mean it can't be done more reasonably. I mean, a lot of these, I don't have time to show you the slides, but a lot of these smaller projects have actually been done just by the local group bringing stones into the stream and dropping them in and building the riffles by hand in a small system. And then, of course, the cost is very, very low. So it depends on the magnitude, and it depends on how much regulation or pre-project study is required. It can get pretty ridiculous. I mean, there are projects that were done for six and seven thousand dollars in spots in Manitoba that Mark and I worked on that when they've been redone now they've cost sixty sixty or seventy thousand dollars but that's just because the process has changed and uh, and the way we regulate them I like the Australian method where you had this little grid of identifying your own problem peculiar to that and then uh, when I was working there very often at the end of a course or end of a week workshop or something um, all these Australians would get together and jump in the stream and throw the rocks in and fix the whole thing so if you ever get to uh, some parts of Queensland and particularly Crystal Waters area and the Glasshouse Mountains it's a whole bunch of streams with hand built riffles in them that work really well I think they cost quite a bit of wine and beer, but probably <laughs> that was about it. <laughs> awesome. Uh, he con Trevor continues says, also, many of us have used digger logs, deflectors, and rock sills in the past as they are low-cost restoration designs. Personally, I have had success using these designs for habitat restoration projects. Can you comment on whether you think these designs are useful in some scenarios? And just as an addendum, he says, for reference, he did his restoration work with Charlie McInnes, uh, which he um, feels you that you, he says, I think you are familiar with his work. Yep, right. So <clears throat> almost anything can be fitted to the right situation. So if you have fairly mild gradients um, and you can allow the water to dig pools with a digger log um, without undermining it or having the flow go underneath it, sure, it works. It works fine. Um, you have to remember that a lot of those techniques, though, were, were developed in the alluvial streams in the United States. So you have, uh, um, as uh, Wolman and Leopold and these people, always their, their preamble to describing the river characteristics would say, these characteristics apply to a river that has built its own valley bottom. In other words, the materials that are deposited by this river are in, con are in line with what the river forces are, or the shear stresses are, that are moving the material. In Canada, we just don't have that option. There are lots of places where the rivers are more rugged, or there's some deposit of some kind that really isn't river built. So often the case is that we can't use those solutions. But there are places in alluvial streams, low gradient, where in fact you'd get away with it. Now, how would you determine that? Well, again, I'd go out, do some surveys where there's natural conditions in it, see how much drop there was in small structures, and then I would limit myself to what those drops were. Unfortunately, often these structures are simply stuck in and in the hopes that they're going to create the right condition, but they're in the wrong setting, or the gradient is too steep, or the materials are too fine. So it does take, uh, there isn't a, in other words, there isn't a standard structure you can throw in. It does take some kind of um, analysis in the first place. Um, I often found, for example, people are very big on putting in root wads and, and a few rocks on the side of the channel. And if you do that, of course, you speed the flow up next to those structures, and they do build a bit of a hole. But if you speed the flow up too much, the structures just fall in after a few years. Now that's a fairly simple analysis using these hydraulic equations. How much will the velocity be? How much will the shear stress be? And how much of the sediment would be removed by that kind of shear stress? So maybe a couple of pages of calculations, and sure enough, you can get away with that. But in fact, if it does look like it's going to erode, then you have to shift back to something that's a little more rugged than that. He makes it sound so easy. Uh, another question from uh, Paul Giroux. I think he's from Parks Canada. He says, Bob, do you ever use wood in your designs? If so, how do you keep it where you want it? 
ah, well, <clears throat> we didn't have time for that equation. <laughs> but you can actually, you know, I keep talking about the bed material and the banks and moving through the river and trying to restabilize them. But actually, you can calculate fairly easily the direct force of the flow as well. You know, that's not too hard to do. In fact, it's a, I won't write it on the board, but it's 100 times the cross-section times the velocity squared is actually the force against something exerted by the flow when it's completely blocked in the system. So in that case, when you're putting in logs and things like this in the river and you're trying to calculate the force against it, if you can predict the velocity, back to good old Manning's equation or one of the, uh, one of the hydraulic equations, and you know how big the object is, in other words, you know how much area it's blocking, then you can calculate the force of the flow. So think about all the ways you could have of holding that wood in place. Say you're putting in woody debris. You could, you could calculate what size of cable it would take to hold it from upstream. Or you could calculate how many rocks you should put on top of it so that it was so heavy that the weight of the rocks on the woody debris wouldn't cause it to move away. It's a simple calculation, but um, so often I don't see it done. I just see, you know, throw the, ropes, throw the wood in and then the first flood comes and the whole works is gone. Okay, I can't. I, I, I can't resist. I can't <laughs> resist the force. Hundred times the area times the velocity squared, and this is in kilograms. So, so that's the actual. That's the actual force now that's being exerted. I'll get my head out of the way. That's the actual force that's being exerted on the object in the water. So, sorry, I just added one more equation. <laughs> there you go, Paul. Uh, okay, we've got one more here, and this is Catherine Collette, who you know from uh, Natural Resources mm -hmm. here in New Brunswick. Yeah, she, hi, says, <laughs> she says, lots of interest in manipulating cold water from tributaries into main stem rivers by changing entrance conditions. Your thoughts? Right, so here, here's a really interesting question that none of these equations solve. <laughs> Remember everything. Remember my schematic? Well, the way these equations see the river is this big block of solid water that moves along and doesn't break up into any components. Now you're talking about something that's way more interesting. <clears throat> so this is possible um, to do, you might do a model study to start with or something like this, but it's actually pretty easy to manipulate portions of the flow by putting in some small bars. Um, something that can divert, say, flow away from the bank in the area that you'd like to have the cold water continue. In other words, you can confine some of these flows within the flow. So a flow within the flow is not a strange idea at all. I mean, that, that's what the Gulf Stream is. I mean, the Gulf Stream is, is uh, water that moves through the ocean as a body of warmer water as it goes from the Maritimes over to Scotland or to England. I mean, this is the thing that is water flowing within water. And how you achieve that, it works because of the density difference. And how you preserve the water so it has that density for as long as possible has got a lot to do with how how you might manipulate the entrance, and maybe even how you manipulate some of the roughness in the channel as it goes downstream from there. But it'd be a very interesting thing to, to look at. I'm, I'm pretty sure it would be case specific for a river, but uh, something that could be easily done. I mean, to be honest about it, the way I sort this out is I usually go out there with a bunch of plastic survey tape, and I stand on the river, and I start playing out hundreds of feet of it, and try to figure out just where a, a real current, I mean, the real current goes by watching the, the path in the plastic tape. Uh, occasionally, I might use a fly line for that if it just happens, as there might be fish there as well. <laughs> Uh, okay, we have another question from Alita Corbett. Uh, she says, in your experience, what would you say the lifespan are of or is of these structures? Depends on the system, but as an average? Well, the, the, um, the first ones that I was involved with in breaking up, uh, we're trying to break up the gradients in alluvial fans below the Manitoba escarpment and below the Niagara escarpment. These are in these shale bed streams, and the gradients were very high because people have dug uh, drainage ditches or dug channels in the alluvial fan material and you know the way the fans work the water spread out over the surface of the fan and never developed much depth I mean the, that's what the fan that's how the fan was built and then of course we came along and bought this piece of property and that piece of property and the ditch there to disturb to uh, pick up all the water and then it very quickly downcut in the system 
So those were built uh, with step channels going back up through alluvial fans to try to stop uh, sedimentation downstream and to stop the banks from collapsing. And those were built in 1974 to 1978. And they're all still in place and they all still work. So those are the oldest projects I know. In other words, if the hydraulic conditions are created, um, there is infilling that occurs and there's certainly some change in the channel pattern through time as sediments accumulate behind some of these dams and the alluvial fans. They're pretty dynamic systems, but once the gradient was broken, then the feeding of sediment further downstream stopped and the streams achieved a stable state for, I guess, the last 30 or 40 or 50 years. So I know most of them last a long time. They aren't things that wash out. I mean, they're not woody debris. They're not something that's put in that's going to rot away. These are, these are adjustments in the actual stream profile itself. Come back here. So okay. a long time, if they're designed right. <laughs> Thank you super much, Bob. I think we're going to stop things. We don't have any more questions. So I want to thank Great. you very much. That was the longest Q&A session we've had to date, and uh, I'm sure we could have questions go on and on. Um, so for a <laughs> reminder of the people still online, um, the next presentation in this series will be, um, we 